Yo, what's up, y'all? Welcome back to another Fish the Moment live stream and podcast. Tonight, we're joined by Randy Blockett, and we're going to be t- breaking down your recent tournament on Grand Lake. Uh, knows a little bit of a tough tournament for you, Randy, but honestly, those tough tournaments is what we learn the most from. Sometimes you learn more from not catching them than you do from being all over them. So I think that we're going to be able to learn a lot from this, and Randy's going to break down what a lot of the guys were doing out there as well as kind of what he was doing and his mentality and all that stuff. So I think that's going to be a great learning lesson for everyone. And then I'm going to be uh, also breaking down a new strategy that I think I can help you guys employ to put more fish in the boat. And the idea, Randy, is that if you make fewer casts, you're going to catch more fish. This is not related to electronics or anything like that. (laughs) Got the family in the background. Uh, no worries there. Okay, he's <laughs> but how are you doing tonight, Randy? <laughs> There's a reality TV here, man. There we go. How's it going tonight, Randy? Good, yeah, good, man. Yeah, that Grand Lake tournament, man, that was a really big disappointment. We It really reminded, we had a tortoise, or was, I think back then it was, a, it was a different series, but we had one there several years ago, one, the one Bradley Hallman won yeah. three or four years ago almost exact conditions except the water was not quite as clear this year so um yeah we'll go over that in detail and i'll sort of maybe you know, i think a lot of guys can probably learn something from the mistakes i made in that tournament you know i've had a chance to reflect on it quite a bit over the last week awesome yeah and then i'm, I'm going to be breaking down a trip i took the arkansas river and caught some really good fish and i started thinking about it more and i was realizing that that fishing trip I did a lot of driving, not a lot of fishing, but I never used my electronics. I literally, I didn't have any mapping or anything. I I didn't have any of my electronics on, didn't turn on live scope, but I still used my searching tools that are available to me, my eyes, my other uh, resources to help find some fish. So I want to talk about that and how you guys can potentially put more fish in the boat by casting less, maybe chilling out a little bit more, enjoying the scenery, and uh, still putting a beat down on them. So we're going to be talking about that as well. Good deal. So before we jump into that, first thing we need to do is always give a shout out to our sponsors. First up, Bridgeford Foods. Bridgeford Beef Jerky is some of the best beef jerky on the market. Super tender and better than anything, Bridgeford is a company that supports bass fishing. It supports the hobby that we love. It supports professional bass fishermen. It supports this podcast and live stream here and allows us to do this every single week. So if you guys want to help support a great brand that, pr- that produces a high quality product, super tender jerky that also supports bass fishing. Check out Bridgeford Foods, whether it's beef jerky, whether it's the pepperoni, there's all kinds of great stuff that Bridgeford makes. And you can find that at Walmart, Dollar General, any of the dollar stores, also a lot of the local gas stations. So definitely check out Bridgeford Beef Jerky. Uh, they sponsor Randy, they sponsor the live stream, we sponsor Matt Stefan, who also works with us. So they're really helping us out. So definitely check them out and uh, give them some love. Next up, got to give a shout out to our other sponsor, The Bass Tank. The Bass Tank is the premier bass fishing electronics installation company in the country. And if you guys need anything done to your boat, any electronics, stuff like that, check out The Bass Tank. You can give them a call at their number, 918-509-7864. You can talk to them about anything in in terms of your electronics setup, whether you need side imaging, down imaging, how many units you need, how to mount them, how to put the power system in, which units to use for different uh, species of fish, everything like that. They can get you set up with power poles, with batteries, anything you need. The Bass Tank has you covered. Check their website out, thebasstank.com, if you want to browse their inventory of products. And definitely check out the Bass Tank. If you're in the market for electronics and want to get everything set up properly, it's the only company I trust to touch my boat, put electronics on my boat, and they do a great job. They Frankenstein my boat, Randy, with like 17 different graphs, and they all have dedicated power. And they all, all did it in my old 18-foot Triton, 2005 18-foot Triton, and they have like 17. It's, I can, literally can run 17 different graphs in my boat. That is unreal. Um, they have different power cords. Different stuff. I don't run 17 at a time. I only run one unit at the dash, and I run a couple of units up front. But I can switch them in and out and all that stuff with the power cable. So it's a crazy setup, uh, which helps me do product yes, testing and stuff for you guys. But uh, you know, if they can do that in the 18-foot Triton, they can rig anything. Good deal. Awesome. Okay, Randy. So let's jump into it and get into the 
recent tournament you fished on Grand Lake over in Oklahoma. Kind of give us a rundown of what happened and kind of a tough event, but what was kind of the situation leading up to the event? Yeah, that was, it was really an interesting tournament and it, it, it reaffirms to me how there's such a fine line in bass fishing in general between having a really good day on the water and having a poor day on the water. It's just a matter of a bite here or a bite there pointing you in the right direction. So going into that tournament, um, if you guys know much about Grand Lake, it, it has been getting beat to a froth by tournaments up leading up into this tournament. I'm talking tur even tournaments during the week. There was a 600 boat tournament during the week down there, the week before the tournament on top of the weekend tournaments. So um, that was a big factor for me going into that tournament. I, I sort of felt that those fish from one end to the other would just be really, really finicky and, and pressured. So my plan going into that tournament is I was trying, I was going to try to figure out a way to, to finesse fish to catch the better fish, like with wacky rigs and shaky heads, because when those bass are locked down spawning, you can catch good ones doing that and you can win doing that. That's one of the few times a year you can actually catch quality fish doing that. The, I really felt going into there that those fish should be all over the beds. And the first practice day, I fished, I practiced two and a half days. And the first practice day, it reaffirmed that there were beds everywhere. But the beds, a lot of the beds there were in really, really shallow water because the lake had come up a couple of weeks before and they'd been dropping it fast. So you saw just, you could go in about any cove that had decent clarity and you could see beds in three to six inches of water that the fish had vacated. And then as the day went on, you know, I started noticing a lot of beds down that you could, you could see the beds as a light spot, but unless the wind, unless there was sun or no wind, you couldn't really make out if there was a fish there. It was a real marginal deal. So I knew going into this tournament that the bedding fish would be a key, but I had a, I, I thought it would be really difficult to sight fish simply because of the clarity issue that we had. Um, so the first day of the tournament down there, and, and I had a decent practice. You know, I had one I, one day I fished in the dirty water and had 14 or 15 pounds. And the other days, you know, I didn't, I had my hooks cut over or my hooks cut off and I was getting some bites. And I was real familiar with the fish bed there. And the problem that you had that I knew I had to get past is like the lower end of the lake where you had the best water clarity, where everybody was because you could see better. Literally, if, if you were fishing from the mouth of Horse Creek, um, let me share my screen here, Johnny. I'll sort yep. of show you guys what I'm talking about here. Sort of give you a, a uh, option here. By the way, I saw the comment. You got it there, Johnny? Yeah, I got it. It says, uh, Bass Slacker says, this is why Johnny uses moderately priced reels. More catching, less casting. Very true. We'll get into that yeah. in the second half of the stream, but uh, yeah, now you guys know I use forty dollars fishing reels. Uh, can't cast okay. them too many times, otherwise they're going to get screwed up. <laughs> Can you, you see the map there, Johnny? Yep, I got you. Okay, this area right here, which is the here's the dam right here, at Grand. So this area right here was where most the entire field was within the circumference right here. Literally, if you if you fished any of these. Uh, coves, pockets, creeks through here, you could not go into the back of any of them. I'm talking about all these, all these little, you know, side pockets like this off the creek. You literally could not go into any single pocket there without there being a boat there. Either a boat was in there, but boat or two, if it, one was coming out or if you're back in there, one, one was coming in. So you had to have a mental shift that, you know, you were going to fish around boats. There wasn't any getting past of it. Mm. So all the fish were in here bedding in these in these coves here on the lower end of the lake. It's like every bass in this area was on the bed right here. So I was going in these coves and pockets like this and just basically working a wacky rig and a shaky head just down the bank and behind the docks, between the docks, that type of stuff. And the first day of the tournament, I caught 11 and a half pounds and I caught quite a few keepers. I probably caught, you know, two and a half limits of fish or more but I never got any good ones. I mean, the biggest fish I caught was like two and three quarter pounds. Mm -hmm. Normally you'll pick up a couple pounders this time you're doing that. The first day of the tournament, you know, I was in hundred place or whatever with 11 something pounds. There was, they just absolutely whacked them. It was like 14 and a half pounds was the top 40. And I couldn't really figure out why that was. I didn't understand why I was around those fish 
and could and was so far down the first day. So I sort of felt that it was a bait selection. I sort of felt that I was in the right water, but I had to upgrade my bait and maybe back off a little bit. Um, I think a lot of those guys that did good bed fish and they were either visually seeing those fish and they were in an area that were protected and they could see those deeper beds and they were able to pick those fish off that they could see on those deeper beds or they were blind pitching you know bigger, bigger baits like a brush hog or an eight inch lizard or a beaver or something like that to, to generate those quality bites second day of the tournament um i was uh I, you know i knew i had to make a comeback because i was three pounds or two and a half pounds out of the money so what I did that second day was I started out um, down here in the dirty water close to uh, the takeoff. Um, pull up here. Um, there had been a ton of tournaments around the Wolf Creek area right here. And this is the area that I caught that 14 or 15 pound bag the first day. I was pitching a jig around lay downs and throwing a crankbait. So I felt you know, maybe I could stay around this release area here and maybe sneak in and catch a big bag of fish, fish and shallow. Cause I've had some good ones at the last practice day. I fished in here for two and a half hours in this area and lost one decent fish on a crankbait. And that was it. The wind was coming up super hard. It was blowing out of the South, like 30 miles an hour. So this, it was very difficult to fish in here. So I decided to run up here and uh, I went back in some of these pockets for like an hour just to see if I could catch a few in the shaky head. And I caught one. So it's like 11 o'clock in the morning. And I said, this isn't going to work. I said, I'm going to have to do something completely different if I'm going to do anything. So I put on that mega bass mag draft, um, six inch mag draft. And I put on a, uh, this, uh, a big glide bait that uh, one of my YouTube subscribers made for me. And I started running these main lake points thinking I could intercept some, some pre-spawners that were coming into these spawning pockets. And the first point I came to, I caught a nice one, you know, nice two and a half pound Kentucky or whatever on the mag draft. And I said, man, that's good. Maybe this is going to be the deal. Fished around a little bit more, lost one other one that felt really good on it and wound up for the day. I, I had, you know, I, I caught four fish. I lost two caught or lost two and caught four just basically fishing these points with a big swim bait and the mag draft on the main lake here, uh, simply trying just to do something to catch a big bag. I didn't think that I could go back into these same pockets after there was boat after boat after boat for a week and catch 17 or 18 pounds. I figured if I could figure out how to do something a little different that um, I'd have a chance to make a comeback and it didn't work out. I completely got my butt kicked in the tournament <clears throat> and um Looking back in the tournament, I, I think a lot of these guys that did good is they got back into this, these some of these pockets on the lower end and they just creeped through. They, they went back into these areas where they knew the fish were bed. Say, for example, it looks like this pocket right here. This is this would be a prime spawning pocket. I think what happened is a lot of people would gravitate towards the back end. A lot of these guys that did good, they'd start at the mouth of these things and they just creep through here with the trolling motor barely moving, looking down into the water, trying to see those, if they could see any deep beds. Yeah. And th that's how those guys did good there. They just fit, they located those deeper beds. They were able to see them. They were able to be in areas that were protected a little bit from the wind. And uh, that's what happened. You know, that's, that, that, that's how they caught them. I'll give you guys a prime example. Um, last, three years ago in that tournament that Bradley Hallman won, the same thing happened the first day of the tournament. I had um, 11 something pounds and I was in the middle of the pack. The second day of the tournament, I ran to the back of this creek right here. It just, I was just, I had been fishing the lower end. I ran to the back of this creek right here and I just wanted to see if I could find some bed and fish. And there, it, for whatever reason, overnight, a bunch of big ones moved up right here. And this, it, it had been getting hammered and throughout the week. But I was the first boat back in there and I wound up catching 18 and a half pounds. I never left. I stayed right here the entire day and just looking for sight fish. I caught them all on beds and I'd, I'd be working a bed fish. And all of a sudden I'd look over three or four feet away and I'd see another. It's like they were building beds as we were speaking. And I think that's what's pro that what probably happened. I think that's probably what happened to Jeff Reynolds. He got into area where there was a lot of fish that pulled up in there just like what happened to me three years ago. And that was the difference between um, having a good tournament and just 
doing terrible like I did. For sure. It's mm. it's crazy how that can happen where those bed fish, they move in. And there's a couple – this is some stuff that I've heard, and I want to get your opinion on this because this is how I would approach this tournament. And I want to get your opinion on whether you think this would work, Randy, because there is two schools of thought. The first school of thought that I've heard guys who bed fish talking about is – they go into an area in practice and they look for spots that should have beds in them where there are no bed fish in practice. So the idea is you figure out where the bed fish are and then you fear, figure out, oh, I don't see any beds yet in this area or there's not very many, but those fish should be moving up and starting to make their beds. Like, And you're basically trying to predict when those fish move up or sometimes if the beds are all empty – and other fish will move in and actually reuse the same beds. And I've heard a lot of guys talk about that. I personally suck at bed fishing because I'm colorblind. My eyesight isn't that great regardless. And I feel like that's a big disadvantage. I've also I've actually thought about getting polarized, colorblind, correcting glasses just for sight fishing. Because like I can be sitting with the exact same $200 pair of Oakley sunglasses or whatever sunglasses you want, looking at the same fish as this one guy. And I can not see it hardly at all and then that guy's like oh there it is and it's in six foot of water i can't do it so yeah. um not my style but uh have you heard of guys doing that in the past what are your thoughts on that yeah i think there's a science to that and here here's one of the things that separates guys that are expert bed fishermen from guys that are just like bed fishermen that, that, that roll down the bank and if they see one they try to catch it i had a chance to talked to Guido Hibden quite a bit about this back when he was at the top of his game with bed fishing. And Guido was like the father of bed fishing. He was the one that he won a, uh, a, a big t- giant tournament down at Lake Lanier back in the mid eighties off of beds before anyone knew it used to be people didn't know people thought that bedding bass wouldn't bite for, for decades. It was, it's only been up until like the early nineties where people became good at catching bed fish. But what Guido told me, and a couple other people I know, Aaron Martin's told me the same thing, is that the best bed fishermen in the world, they don't look for fish on a bed. They look for they look for beds that are so deep and that are so um, inobvious that the only thing you can see is, a, is maybe some movement down there. There's, they never, ever see the entire fish. They, they might see just a bit of a tail once in a while or, or they, see, they see an object moving across the bed. So it's not like you look down there and you see a four pounder sitting that you're going to watch it eat the bait. And that's the difference that separates everybody is they have the ability to see parts of a fish that most people don't even think is a fish. And then on top of that, they have the, um, they have the awareness to understand and read the mood of that fish to know within a couple of miles, a couple minutes, if that fish is even going to bite. And, you know, I've heard Shaw Grigsby talk about it. A lot of the really good bed fishermen is they can, they can gauge just by the way the fish moves and within a few minutes, how long it's going to take to catch it or if it's catchable or not. But I think ultimately it's just like what you said, Johnny, I think some people, and I'm colorblind too. So I'm the same way. I understand some people just have the ability to see those fish better and they understand they know what to look for. And it's the same with you on electronics. It's like, you can see something on a side on a side imaging uh, a picture that I don't even know it's a fish. You can say, "Yeah, there's a fish right there behind that rock," and I'm like, "What? What are you looking at?" It's the same with bed fishing. I mean, those they can say, "Oh, there's a I can see there's a three pounder down there," and most people can say, I, "I can't. I don't even see anything down there." Yeah. So it, it's an art form for sure. That it's it's super um, it, it's super interesting too because you you can't practice sight fishing year round as well right. as i mean you can sometimes find like the fish that are up running brim beds stuff like that wolf packs cruising but bed fishing is a very specific time of the year and i think that it's tough because you don't you can't practice that all the time so you have to really commit to it and maybe go fishing like driving around the country like really learning that skill and that's not something that i um really feel like i've ever put the time into I normally during the spawn get to fish once or twice during like the heart of the spawn when it's like really happening. So I've never really practiced that. But another technique that's been really effective for me, because I know a lot of guys, some guys just don't like fishing for bedding bass. And it's just, you know, if you're good at it and you put the time into it, awesome. And it can be very, very effective. 
but it's not always the best way to do it. So what I have done, this is, I'm just pulling up Blake Darnell here. And that's why I give you an example because I won a uh, junior state tournament doing this one year on Lake Darnell. And I, it was a complete bed fishing tournament. There was just fish on the beds everywhere. And what I realized is that I had zero chance, zero chance of beating anybody if I was going to go into the clear water areas bed fishing. Back in some of these backwater quarry ponds and stuff, there's very clear water. And I actually fished a junior state tournament on Dardanelle three or four years before that in the exact same basically weekend and scenario. And I got my butt kicked by everybody in these quarries sight fishing and I tried to do it and it just didn't work. So I said, I'm not sight fishing. I'm not going to worry about that. I need to figure out another approach. So what I did is I went into these spawning bays where there wasn't enough water clarity to see any fish on beds. And if you look through here, there's a lot of, um, grass, there's matted grass, uh, hyacinth mats, there's water willow mats, and there's also some riprap. And I literally, Randy, went and I fished this bay right here from here in this bay to right here. And then I fished down in this creek. I fished right in here in this little bay. And for eight hours, I fished those three little sections. And I basically went and flipped every foot, every single foot, for the entirety around these creeks. It took me eight hours to basically go all around this. And I mean, it was painfully slow going through here. And guys were passing me on the troll mower. Literally, people were getting behind me, and I was going so slow, they would pass me. Like, they would go around me fishing fast. And I was dragging a tube, and I would pitch it up to the bank, and I would drag it out to five, six feet of water all the way back to the boat, and then do it again. And I figured out in practice after I got a bite or two doing that in these areas, I could catch some big ones, some three and four pounders. And in the tournament, I had, uh, I think I had like 17 pounds or something like that. And I had a 14 incher in the boat with one of my five keepers. And I jumped off a of five. So I should have had about 22 ish pounds probably uh, for my five fish. And it was the most painfully slow thing in the entire world. And like, it was just crazy how slow I had to fish, but it was that blind sight fishing. Cause I was basically a, pretending like every single pitch it was going to be on a bed and i went through these whole areas and i just knew that these areas in particular were good spawning zones so i went in there and i just fished super slow and it worked out for me and that's how i would probably if i was going to be on grand that's probably how i would have tackled the tournament and i'm going to get your opinion on that because like my my I guess gut instinct would be to find some protected areas as you mentioned there's a south wind here so all this isn't protected but maybe if you got into um maybe one of these backwaters back in here or you kind of have to find places where there's not a lot of runoff i have to kind of check around on grand because you don't want a lot of runoff maybe it's up in uh, this uh, part of the lake but trying to find some more stained water find these pockets that don't have a lot of runoff water get in here where i feel like the fish are going to be bedding and just fish extremely slow blind sight fishing basically just dragging my tube as slow as possible um what is what is your thought on that type of approach do you think that's something that's feasible have you heard guys doing that what are your thoughts there i think you're exactly right on johnny with that here's the, here's the reason i say that is because when you get into an area where the fish are bedding and it's and everything is right especially if you got some quality fish in their bedding there's not just going to be one or two beds there's going to be beds everywhere all over the place and they're going to be in a lot of different depths i'll use a prime example just in that grand tournament where i caught the 18 pounds it's like you would you would see a bed that you could barely see and then if the wind stopped completely and it got completely still you could look around and like within a 20 foot distance around the boat there may be five or six other beds and here's the deal and this is why your tube deal worked it's like you know how bed and fish are just because you pitch your bait out there and get it around the bed doesn't mean it's going to bite it. You have got to, you've got to come at that bed at the right angle with the right bait. A lot of times with multiple presentations, you have to do that. So that makes perfect sense. What you're talking about. If you get into an area where your bed, you have got to slow down to a snail's pace and, and, and work. Even if it's open water, you work it like you're flipping and pitching isolated bushes really slow and methodically over and over and over again because 
just like when you were blind fishing that tube out there, you were, you were obviously dragging that tube through beds that you couldn't see. Yep. And if you missed it, maybe by six inches, if you, if your tube did not lay on the part of that bed where that fish got hot, the, the fish wouldn't go for it. But if you fish real slow, methodically tight casts around it, you're going to get a lot more bites. And I don't think it can be overestimated enough how, sl- how important it is to slow down this time of year when those fish are bedding, whether you can see them or not. And uh, I think the important thing to remember is like, if you see one, especially if it's a decent fish, you can bet there's going to be a lot of them around. And I've, I've never seen anyone that does good in a bed fishing tournament that fishes fast or fishes with moving baits very much. Yep. And here's a, I want to respond to a comment over here. Cause I've seen someone, it's a comment from Stephanie. And she said that, her kids use a deep dive app this weekend on Dardanelle and they both zeroed in their high school tournament and were very disappointed with the app. And they came in and they were really sad and disappointed. And one thing, Stephanie, I have to say is fishing, unfortunately, is like that. I've zeroed so many high school tournaments, zero tournaments, not catching fish. Fishing is not all about just having the, you know, saying, here's the bait, go throw it. There's so much that goes into it from experience and learning. And not catching fish is a great learning experience and overcoming that adversity is something that made me such a better angler. I fished like 150 junior tournaments or like local tournaments, stuff like that. By the time I was 18, I've talked about in crying and sad all the time. Cause I'm like, I can't believe I didn't catch him. And just to comment on the app on like Dardanelle specifically, just to give you an idea of the, the deep dive app. And I've talked about the deep dive app guys in this channel, the idea behind the deep dive app is that it's not supposed to catch fish for you you can't pick up it's not going to pick up your rod cast the bait into the water and catch your fish for you it gives you the patterns that are backed by tournament winning results so for example if you go into the app and you say it's going to show you a flat side crankbait that's because a pro has caught a fish in and finished top five in a lake that's very similar to your lake or your exact lake and it was in these current exact conditions. And then we're going to give you the structure and the cover that that pro used. And we're going, it's all data backed and data driven. But here's the problem. Just because you have the information to throw a flat side crankbait, things like that. If you're throwing a flat side crankbait in the wrong section of your lake, the wrong, wrong area of your lake. And what I mean by that is if you just start fishing down, let's say it says to fish the first half of a creek, and you just pick the first half of this creek right here, for example, off the main river, you start flipping in here, and you follow exactly what the app is saying, you're not going to catch fish because this creek right here is not protected in the spawning situations, it's not... Uh, it's, it's too stained, it's getting affected by the current, and you could fish the first half of this creek right here with all the same cover, all the same structure, and not catch fish. The reason that this is is because you need to find areas that are more protected, for example, like this area that's protected by the bridge. I can't put that into the app at this point. We're still kind of building it. Hopefully that's something we can do into the future to get that specific. But the specific creek that you're in can be the difference between not catching fish or catching fish. There is a very high likelihood that the person who won the tournament or a lot of people who finished high in the tournament were fishing the exact same patterns that the app recommended, but they were doing it in the correct part of the lake. There was another comment about a guy who was on Table Rock who said he was disappointed from his Table Rock finish. And he was using the app recommendations, things like that. Randy, you can vouch for this. You can go on to Table Rock Lake. And if you're not in the right section of Table Rock Lake that week that the fish are firing, and you're not in the right exact creek, it can be a struggle to catch fish. Table Rock is a massive lake. For example, maybe the app recommended in stained water that you need to be fishing a wiggle wart on rock walls. Well, maybe that pattern is dominating up here up the James River, and you can catch fish doing that up the James River in the stained water. But maybe down Long Creek, it's not working all that well. Well, that doesn't mean that stained water wiggle wart bite on Chunk Rock Banks isn't working. It's just not working in Long Creek, but it might be working up here in the uh, river up here, James River. But we can't know whether Long Creek or the James River is going to be the best area to do it. And if you look at any pattern that is any tournament, Randy, there's always guys catching fish different ways. And maybe you try something in the tournament and don't catch them, but someone else is doing it. Like you could have tried to bed fish, Randy, and you didn't catch any fish on beds and you didn't do well, but someone figured it out and they were doing it in the areas you were trying, but they were in the right pocket at the right time. 
So I'm not to say that I'm saying that I, you know, I'm not trying to be on here, you know, saying that the app is this cure all solution. It's data. It says here are the most likely areas and the patterns and stuff to fish. I think a lot of guys who fish understand uh, this because if you have enough knowledge of bass fishing, you can understand that, hey, you're not going to go out there and hammer them every single time. And it's not this, there's no app that's going to tell you exactly go fish right here to catch fish and do it this way. And even if you do that, maybe you're not retrieving the bait the right way or moving the bait the right way. There's so many things that go into it. But what this app can do is give you the real historical results of what guys have caught fish on in the past and then giving you the real weather conditions that give you a good starting point of what to start looking for. You're, it's up to you to go and find the right stretch of bank or the right creek to put fish in the boat. And that's part of the fun of fishing. If the app was just buy the app, use the app, you catch fish, why would anyone ever fish tournaments? Because there's no skill involved in that. There's still there's still skill involved in it. And that's the thing with like just because you can say, hey, uh, NBA player, shoot more three-pointers because you have a better chance to win. Well, if you're not Steph Curry and you can't hit three-pointers because you don't have the technique, it doesn't matter if we tell you to go shoot more three-pointers if you can't do it. It's the same thing with the app. We can tell you this is the best things to be doing, but you still have to go execute on it. So that's the whole thing, Randy. There's a big comment thread of people going on there. Um, So hopefully that makes sense. I'm not trying to offend anybody with these comments. I'm just trying to explain this is how it is. And fishing is just tough. So sometimes catching, not catching fish is just part of it, unfortunately. Um, What what are your thoughts on that, Randy? I'll add one thing to that, Johnny. It's like there here's one of the realities behind bass fishing is there's no guarantees in fishing and you can't make fish bite. The the great one of the greatest things that the app does is it, pro, it provides a foundation. But that foundation there in bass fishing, there are a lot of uncontrolled variables. Now say for example, you know, you follow the app and everything is this data that has been entered that is has gotten reproductible results. Nothing can predict things like Say, for example, there may be another boat that rolled in 30 minutes before that bank that you fished and they just they whacked them on there. Or the people that were fishing, maybe they weren't the best casters and they didn't have the right casting angle or they didn't use the right retrieve speed. Or it could have been a timing thing based upon how the clouds were coming over at the time. There's tremendous amount of uncontrolled variables in fishing, but the the great thing about like either using the app or getting a guide or something like that is they give you a foundation to build upon and um, everything else has to unfold during the day. So I said, it's the same thing. It's like I've, I fished table rock for over 50 years. I know it as good as anybody that on that lake. And there's still days that I go out there and don't catch anything, even though I know it better than anybody. So that's, that's why bass fishing guys is the most difficult sport there is period because you've got so many controlled and uncontrolled variables in it for sure and i mean guys i'm, I'm over i'm we're trying to make this app something that's very useful to get you guys a starting point and again we're not saying on here this is the thing that makes you catch fish every time but any little bit of information advantage you can get i use the app you've seen me use it in videos randy i was on beaver lake the other day and i was like what pattern should i be using well i pulled up the app and it said, use a flipping jig in the back half of creeks on laydowns. Well, I fished like four different backs half of creeks with laydowns, five different backs half of creeks with laydowns, and only one of the five produced a fish, but it was a four pounder almost. So it worked, but I had to get in the right creek in the right scenario, and I caught some shorter fish. So it's like, it just because then the app didn't get me like there's no way to say this creek is the one with the perfect conditions to go catch fish if that was the case every single pro if if i could create an app that could do that every pro would be using it right now and they would catch 15 pounds of fish in every single tournament every single scenario there would never be people who don't catch fish but that's just not realistic so hopefully that yeah anyways um yeah that that's enough i i think people got it um i i hope that people understand that but if people don't understand it i mean that's it's not the product for you and and that's fine that's that's completely you know completely fine so um okay so randy let's jump into uh talking about this other topic i want to get into and not talking about the app too much so i was out on 
the Arkansas River the other day. And I wanted to kind of run through this day with you because I'm sure that you can give a lot of insight on this as well, just as being a shallow water angler. But basically, I was on a new pool of the Arkansas River I had never been to. And I think one thing that a lot of guys mess up on when they go fishing anytime is, and this kind of gets to the finding the right area deal, um, is they get to the lake and they have the strong urge to just start fishing. You want to pick up a rod and you just want to start going down the bank. I'm trying to find this pool, the Arkansas River I was on. <laughs> um, so they want to just start going and fishing down the bank. So I launched here. I'm going to show you guys where I was at on the Arkansas River. I was back in here. So I launched here. This is the Clear Creek Pool in the Arkansas River. Uh, and I'd never fished this pool before. I'm not really sure why or how because it's only like an hour from my house. But I grew up fishing the Arkansas River Pool 5, 6, and 7 uh, by Little Rock. So I kind of know how to fish in the river and I kind of know what I'm looking for. So I launched here and I resisted the urge to just pick up like a spinnerbait or a crankbait and just start fishing down the bank. Everything on the Arkansas River looks beautiful. There's laydowns, there's rock jetties, there's riprap. If you've ever been to the Arkansas River, you know there's just stuff everywhere that looks good to fish. But I resisted that urge, and what I ended up doing, Randy, is I started just idling. I didn't I didn't want to run back in here because it gets all silted in and stuff. Um but basically, I started idling. I actually idled all the, all the way into the back of this pocket. I saw the water was really kind of stained. It didn't look that great, so I just idled out of there. I idled back into this area, checked it out. Didn't really look all that great. The water was a little bit wonky color, so I come out. And I finally get my way all the way back into here, and I work into actually this little cut back in here. And I had been driving my boat for like an hour, hour and a half without making a cast. And I was just kind of... I could probably get this done faster if I was on another lake where I could run, but because it's so treacherous back on the Arkansas River, I was idling before I started running. Now I know the path so I can run it, but I was just trying to find the path. And I got back in here, and instead of wasting my time fishing every single lay down or stick up that I saw on the way back in this area, I waited till I saw something that was awesome, that was really, really good. And back in here, there's actually a little stretch where the water was coming over the top of this um, road or levee or jetty, whatever you want to call it. And the water was trickling over this and it just looked ideal. And I was like, I got to try casting at this. So I pulled my boat around, made a cast, caught a four pounder on my third cast of the day. Boom. Caught a four pounder, caught a couple more shorts and then rolled around, went back through this area, found another little area where the water was coming over, caught another like two and a half pounder. Awesome. Then I idled all the way back in here, spent about 30 to 45 minutes idling back in here. Noticed the water wasn't getting any clearer. I thought that maybe the water could be clear back in here because of this sandbar. But unfortunately, the water creeped through there and it muddied this whole backwater up. So that was a bummer. So I, I ran all the way back out of here, ran up here, and started running up the river, idled some more. And then as I got up around this corner, I noticed that there was actually this little pipe here. And it was just a pipe and the water was getting pushed out of it. I'm going to see if I can find an image. There you go. You can see this image. There's water gets pushed out of this. There's like an actual discharge pipe. And so I, I don't know if it's like a, a poop pipe or something. Hopefully not because I would have been unfortunate. But rolled up here, picked up a Mega Bass Super Z2 crankbait, your, your favorite uh, crankbait or handy, and caught like a three and a half pounder. And then I ran up the river some more, got over here, found another area where the jetty was rolling through and the water was coming over, caught another solid two and a half pounder. In this whole time, Randy, I basically drove my boat. I calculated it. I drove my boat just idling around. And I, again, I could have probably saved time by running, but at the beginning, I was just learning the area. So I did all this driving around and I drove my boat for like four and a half hours and I spent an hour and a half fishing those five spots I mentioned. I really fished them thoroughly. And I caught four fish that were, I, I haven't tallied up, it was like a four, a three and a half, a three and a two and a half. And I fished for an hour and a half of fishing. But the reason for that is because I didn't waste my time going and fishing every single bank that looked like it had laydowns on it or trying to hit every single uh, good looking spot. I waited to find a great looking spot. And this is something that I do all the time, Randy, offshore that I do with my electronics. I'll graph and I'll look for these ideal looking spots on my fish finder. But you can do this as well on a lake. You can go through and sometimes find 
these really obvious looking areas. Now this was kind of an extreme example because on the Arkansas River, it's a little bit more obvious what the good spots look like with the water coming over the top and all that stuff, you know, current stuff. But even on a lake like a Grand Lake or a um, Table Rock Lake, where we talk about a lot, let me try to find, uh, oh, it's up, sorry, Grand Lake, sometimes you can just figure out, Randy, that you run into a pocket and you realize, man, this pocket is really muddy. It doesn't look that good. The water temperature isn't right. You run to this pocket. Ah, this doesn't look quite right. The water temperature is too cold. Then you roll into this pocket and all of a sudden the water has that perfect tint, two two to two and a half foot of visibility. Water temperature is in the perfect range for what you want. You see bait fish kicking. You see birds diving around. And then you roll through here and you start catching them. And you didn't stop in this creek or stop in this creek because they didn't look right. They didn't scream, this is fishy. And I think that so many anglers have that instinct in their brain, especially better anglers, where they know what a good looking creek looks like. Or they know like oh, these are the signs that something's happening. There's birds busting. There's bait fish on the surface. or something happening. And we never let ourselves get to that moment where we actually find... Oh, sorry, I'm not showing uh, showing my creek here. Um we're not we're not letting ourselves get to one of these creeks over here where you're running into this creek or this creek or this creek and then finally figure out this is the best one because a lot of guys will stop and they'll fish this entire creek and they'll spend an hour fishing out this creek even though it doesn't look that great they're like ah i just gotta start fishing to try to figure something out or they run into this creek and they're like well, it doesn't look perfect but who knows maybe they're here i'm just gonna start casting but that's such a mistake i feel like so many times for anglers because they're basically wasting an hour of their day by fishing water that they feel like, ah, oh, it doesn't look that great with the intention of trying to hopefully get a fish to bite to give them a clue of what to do. Or a lot of times it's better just to use your eyes, use your experience to find a creek that's like, wow, this is so fishy. This looks perfect. And there's a two a double-sided, um, or there's two, two values to this. The first is obviously if you find an area that looks good, it probably is going to be good, but also it's an area that fits your fishing style. A lot of times when you're fishing on Grand Lake, Randy, for example, you might find that there's a lot of clear water on the lower end of the lake. Well, if you're not that much of a clear water angler, you might be running around this part of the lake and being like, ah, none of this stuff feels comfortable. I don't feel like I'm going to catch fish out of this dock because it's too clear, or I don't feel like this bank is going to be any good because there's not enough wind there. And you just don't know why you're fishing there. You're just doing it because you feel like you have to try to fish to try to catch fish. You have to cast to catch fish. I'm not casting. I'm not going to catch any fish. But at the same time, you're also not confident in what you're doing. And if instead you were to run and not spend that time fishing down this creek, but instead spend that 20 minutes that you spent fishing this creek or an hour running up the lake to the mid lake, or even putting your boat on the trailer and going up to a new section of the lake and then launching there and saying, wow, this water has a lot better visibility. It, it sets up to ways I've caught fish in the past. I, I like the way these bank angles are. I like the rock that's in here. It reminds me of a way I've caught fish before. Right away, you already have a positive now reinforcing message that this area is good this area is something that can work and then you can start putting fish in the boat now obviously a prerequisite of that is fishing enough to know uh which stuff looks good for you so this is more of maybe like a intermediate strategy intermediate to advanced where it's like if you have a good amount of experience knowing what works just drive your boat and look for stuff that you're like i can't wait to make a cast on that versus I just can't wait to make a cast period because I want to just start fishing. I'm just going to fish any bank that is in front of me. That I think hurts so many anglers versus drive to an area and, and look for something and don't stop until something is like, Oh my God, I can't not fish that. It's too good looking. What, what are your thoughts on all that, Randy? Well, that's, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, like what Johnny was describing right here, this is the deal, the, the, sort of my anal analysis of it. That comes, in order to be able to decipher that and to look at something and read the potential, that it takes experience because yeah. you have got to be able to have something to relate to as far as what makes that particular area good. One of the most important, I probably, probably think one of the most top three important things any bass angler has to do is you have to identify the body of water that you're on. There's three different type of lakes. It'd be a pattern lake, and it'd be an area lake, and a junk fishing. 
And what Johnny's describing right there, as far as being able to pick out the potential of an area, depends on that type of lake. Some lakes, um, let's talk about a junk fishing lake first. Some lakes, and you can use Dardanelle as a prime example here, because Dardanelle's got all three. Yep. A junk fishing pattern would be, for example, you're running down the river and you see a barge piling and you catch one off the barge piling. Then you run down the river half mile later and there's a little stretch of riprap and you catch one off that. Then you run down the river and there's you see an isolated lay down on the bank and you catch one off of that. That's typical junk fishing pattern, but a junk fishing lake, but you can't hardly ever win a tournament doing that. You can make the money, but you can't win. Then you have a pattern lake. A pattern lake would be, you know, some type of a deal. Let's say that you got on a deal about the the barge tie ups and you ran them all over Lake Dardanelle from one end to the other. Every barge pie, 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 or piling you saw had a fish on it. But the key thing that you have to fi- to figure out, and what Johnny's talking about here, is you have to identify an area lake. An area lake, every single lake has a part of the lake that has potential to hold a large group or a large concentration of fish. And normally, like on a lake like Dardanelle, this would be like a creek arm. Say for example, say for example, you found a uh, one of the smaller creeks on the upper end of the lake. Say, Johnny, you can go up above um, uh, what some of those creeks on the upper end of the lake, the smaller ones up there yeah, garden. I don't have it pulled up. Yeah. But you might find one creek up there that for some reason, everything's right in it. You've got the right water clarity. You have the right water level. You have the right combination of cover. And there's a big population of bass in that particular creek for whatever reason when you're there. But in order to identify that as a a high potential area, you have to have these factors involved in it. You have to have a diversity, some type of a diversity of cover. You have to have a big enough area and you have to have enough cover to support a concentration of fish. This is how most tournaments are won. Most tournaments are won uh, in areas where you basically put that trolling motor down and you go back and forth all day long. Almost every tournament I've ever won in my career has come like that where I didn't even move my big motor. I could go back and forth and back and forth over an area and pick apart cover. The thing about it is the only way that you can determine, you know, the potential, how good of an area is, is through experience. And and one of the biggest problems that the bass anglers have is they tend to, they tend to either overestimate an area or they underestimate the potential of an area. One of the biggest things that um, a beginning angler or an average angler can do is they underestimate the potential an area has. They may roll through an area and catch one or two decent fish, and they don't realize what they're setting on. They don't realize that if they maximize that area with multiple lure presentations and multiple casting angles and tweaking some stuff here and there, that there's a potential tournament winning area. And then I've seen other guys that that if they catch one seven-pounder, They're locked into an area all day long, and that just may have been a fluke deal. So you have got not only what Johnny's talking about, you have to be able to read the potential of an area and be able to look at it and see how good it's going to be. But you don't want you got to be able to read the potential on both ends, whether it be, you know, good or bad. And uh, one thing that I can tell you guys in bass fishing in general, and I'm not just relating this to tournaments because I know a lot of guys don't fish tournaments is spend your time looking for the areas like what Johnny describes that enable a large population of bass to use a particular area. Don't, don't waste your time fishing, you know, a stump here, a lay down here, a dock over here or something like that. You can catch fish doing that, but it's, you're not going to be consistent day after day after day. And you're not going to have, that's not going to produce those mega bags. He's, These big bags of fish and these days that you remember on the water where you catch 20 pound bags of fish, they usually come on one spot. And, you know, and Johnny can attest to this as far as fishing offshore, you know, he's probably caught hundreds of 20 pound bags of fish off of one point or one drop off or one ledge. And it's the same with me. Most all the 20 pound bags of fish I've caught pitching and flipping shallow water cover, shallow cranking have come without taking my trolling motor up off the water. So and so we can sit here and describe what that is, but a lot of it is just feel, man. You have to get out there and you have to put in your dirt time. Yeah. Well, there's a, I'll give an example on Dardanelle actually, because that was a great example there on Randy. Uh, but even today, 
Um, I went out to the lake and I caught 18 pounds today. Uh, and it was weird because this lake I was on, it's one of my local little lakes and I was, it was 65 degree water temperature and I thought that they were going to be spawning. So I went and threw a buzz bait and a frog and flipped up shallow for like an hour and a half. And of course, knowing me, I find him offshore. So I find a little offshore point with some little bit of grass up there and I tie on a little Neko rig, throw it up there and I catch a four or three and a half and then like on one cast and just hammer them on this. There's these pre-spawn bass and I could tell because there was a little ditch there. It looked perfect. And after I kind of didn't catch anything up shallow, I spent 45 minutes to an hour just graphing. And what I found about this little ditch was that there was some bait around there. I saw a few fish on the graph, on the side imaging, around those grass clumps, and I was able to catch those fish. But it's because I put the flipping stick down, put the buzz bait down, and drove the boat around for 45 minutes. And to give you a great example on Darnell, this is just a good uh, segue. Um, I'll tell you uh, two examples of tournaments. One is just a little local tournament that I did really well in. I think I finished second and had like 18 pounds on Dardanelle. This is like against a local, like really good guy. Some guy had 19. I don't know what he was doing. But basically, um, I want to just go explore these creeks in Spadra. And I'm going to give away some juice here, but a lot of people know about it now, so it's fine. Um, so basically, if you are in this creek right here, then... I went through this entire creek, all of this back in here, and idled all of this, bumped my engine, stumps, all that stuff, and I went through all this, and I just didn't see anything that looked good. I didn't see any bait fish activity, didn't see any good water clarity. It was all the same water clarity all the way through this entire creek. So then I spent like, I think, half a day just idling all of this, <laughs> nothing, then went back and re-idled the next, this next creek. And I just wanted to try to find out if there's anything in these creeks that look good. I didn't want to even fish if it didn't look good. And so I idled all this. I idled back in here. I did all this. Got my boat stuck a couple times. Got pushed. And then finally got back in this little creek, Randy. And you can't really tell on the map here, but this creek is a lot clearer. And there was a pile of gizzard chad back in here. And I don't know why they're back here, but it drops off in like 8 to 10 feet of water. And that's probably why they're there. And there was a little bit of water movement. And right here... Off this point, I saw a couple gizzard chat kicking. And so I didn't have anything else on, so I just threw a 10-inch worm up there. First cast, catch a 6-pounder. And what I'd found was a little shell bed. There's a little point right here, and there's a shell bed. And I ended up catching 18 pounds off of this little shell bed right here. And it's in the very back of this creek. And it's because I spent literally an entire day just idling around. And I only stopped on this spot because I saw a six inch gizzard shad kicking out of the water. And I was like, well, that's got to be a spot with a fish. Boom, caught him. Another example is another creek on Lake Dardanelle where I was going through all these creeks on the very upper end because I was fishing this high school world finals tournament. And there's a million boats to fish this tournament. And I just wanted to get away from the crowd. It was my final year, my senior year. I finished in the top 10 out of 200 boats all three years of this tournament, but I've been bumping boats all that time. And so I'm like, I don't want to mess around with all the other anglers. I'm just going to go find something. So I went as far up this lake as I could. And I basically tried to go into every single little tiny backwater, every slough and creek you could find up here. And I was just going into every single one. And I would try to like get back in here, go all the way to the back, see what's happening, go everywhere. And I finally got into this creek. I went all through this and I mean, I went all over the place and I finally went to this creek and I got all the way here and I got to this point in this creek and I was digging up mud and I was about to turn around and I, my boat, uh, my partner who was with me, he was like, we need to turn around. This is too shallow. And I'm like, let's just keep going. I want to see if there's anything back in here. Maybe we'll hit the gold mine. And we literally pulled back in the back of this little creek, Randy. And for whatever reason, Back in here, the water cleared up like a full two feet. It was like two and a half foot of visibility versus a half a foot on the main river. There were gizzard shad everywhere, busting on the surface and on the graph. We rolled back in here, and within four casts, there's actually a little sandbar that was here. And I just threw a popper across the sandbar. And I made four casts, had two fish miss it, caught two four-pounders. We came back. We didn't even fish this the first few days of the tournament because they zeroed the weights. On the third day of the tournament, we caught 16 pounds in like 15 minutes in here and left. And then we came back the last day, and we caught 19 and a half pounds out of here. We finished second in that tournament. They zeroed the weights every day, which was really annoying because we could have blown the tournament away if they didn't zero the weights because these fish were just in here, and we were just crushing them. 
and we actually had one fish spit up a gizzard chad in the live well. Um, it was like a six inch gizzard chad that would have given us the three ounces we need to win. But that was like one of those areas, and I didn't fish any of this stuff back up in here. I just drove the boat until I found something that I'm like, this looks really, really good. And that's what I do so much with my electronics, but also with shallow water. And I just think that as an angler, finding something that looks different, better water clarity, seeing shad, seeing bird activity, but using your observational senses is way overlooked. I think that so many anglers rely on their bait, getting bit, stuff like that to actually get um, get the fish to bite and to you know find the fish that way. When just using your eyes, using your um, observational skills can go such a long way versus just... I don't know, just fishing. So that's at least my two cents. What do you? What are your thoughts on that, Randy? Yeah, there's, the, and even beyond that is once you identify an area that has potential, it's got everything that lines up right, and you're there at the right time uh, under the right conditions. You have to learn how to maximize that particular area to get the most out of it, and that's one of the things that you know I've had a chance to fish with Rick Clun in tournaments four times. And this was back in the 90s, most of it. And Rick and I have fished for fun together a couple different times. And back when Clun was at the top of his game, this is what I learned from him more than anything else. And I learned this from Larry Nixon fishing with him, too, is that when they find an area and they find a, an area that's good like that, that's got the potential, they take it to the next level. And there is no stone left unturned. It's like they approach every piece of cover from different angles, different casting of trees, different mm -hmm. lures, they make multiple presentations on the same one. They come back through it at different angles. Um, they go beyond fishing the obvious stuff. One of the things that you're going to find is if you find an area that has a lot of really good looking cover, like lay downs or stumps or docks or whatever, and you're catching quite a few fish, there's also fish in that secondary cover, the areas that do not look as good. So, Say, for example, you're getting on an area where um, you've got a good dock bike going. You find a creek that there's, you're getting bit on every three or four, every third or fourth dock. Don't overlook as far as like throwing a shallow running crankbait in between the docks or just fishing some of the, the, the less obvious stuff. And I remember we were fishing, Rick and I were fishing at Lake of the Ozarks um, in a Bassmaster Invitational. We drew, we drew each other out. And of course, everybody was like uh, throwing square bills around shallow laydowns and, you know, around, you know, docks and just stumps and that type of stuff. But once Rick got into an area in that same creek, like I said, he would throw that, that square bill and that spinner bait on everything. I don't care if it was a bare bank or if it was a rock or whatever. I mean, from different angles and wound up catching a big bag of fish off places I never would have cast it to before. So there's your presentation and your mechanics have a lot to do with maximizing the potential of an area. And you can take somebody and you can put them in one of the best areas of the lake that's got a lot of fish biting on it. But if they don't know how to approach that area correctly with the right baits at the right angles, the right retrieves, they're not going to maximize that area. So yep. that's that's a, just another factor to consider with it. Well, no, you and Rick always talk about – now I fish with Rick uh, over on Table Rock like – it was earlier this it was last last fall last fall and we were fishing laydowns and uh, we were way up the river on uh, on table rock and you know he's always talking to me about this and you hear from all his you know tournaments and stuff and he always talks about fishing laydowns making multiple casts going circling around these laydowns and i took picked that up from him and it was so funny because i started doing that while we were fishing up there because i was like i'm with rick clun i better make like 75 casts on every laydown because otherwise he's gonna get mad at me and he's like how do you know to do that? And I was like, well, Rick, you, you said it before. And he, he learned that. He's like, oh, okay. But it was so funny because I was like, uh, I had to make sure I took Rick's advice with, you know, hitting laydowns from different angles and stuff. But like, that was his juice back <laughs> in the day to, you know, just to catch him. And that's stuff he, that guys he's, overlook. He's terrible to fish with. I, I can't, I love Rick to death, but I can't stand fishing <laughs> with him because he hogs up all the water and all the chocolate. The guy, he if he's got five chocolate bars in the boat, he will not share one. He's a chocolate chocolate <laughs> fanatic, and uh, like I said, he doesn't. He's pretty unaware there's anyone else in the boat, but uh, that's just part of being competitive. Oh yeah, that's funny. Uh, so one other thing, I wanted to give an example here from uh, Table Rock because I know that 
I was showing Dardanelle, and that's a dirty water lake. And you guys are like, why is this stuff? This stuff doesn't apply if I'm fishing a deep, clear lake with all the same water visibility. But just to give you a couple more examples, I just like to give as many examples as I can for you guys. Um, one of the uh, videos I filmed a while back on Table Rock, I was catching fish on their boat dock, catching big ones in September, catching four and five pounders. And what I realized is... I was out here and I actually went and got into a tournament and it was this, um, uh, the central pro-ams. It was the last one ever. And I thought I might as well fish it. And I didn't make a video about it or anything. Cause I just wanted to just fish it. And I had 11 pounds for four fish, broke off two big ones. So could have had, could have finished really good. I think it finished like top something or whatever. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. Um, but what the, the reason I bring the tournament up is because I was the only one fishing this pattern out of like 50 boats, top guys in the lake. And what I'd noticed in practice is that if I could go into these creeks in the midsection of the lake and I could find the boat docks that were in the midsection of these creeks that had small, tiny schools of shad. I'm talking like one inch little, I don't even know what they were. They're fry maybe. I don't know what they were, but they're little tiny clouds of bait fish around these boat docks and the stretches of boat docks had clouds of bait fish on them. I could roll in and I could get some really good bites on a jig. I wasn't getting a lot of bites. I was getting like five to seven bites a day and there weren't a lot of these boat docks, but I could even refish them and get more bites. But what would happen is that you go through this entire Creek and like this stretch, these boat docks would have none of those little fry or those little tiny bait fish. And I don't know what they are for September. I don't know. There's not like a shad spawn. I don't think in September, but there was something going on. And most of the bait fish were still out on the main lake in September. If you graft and found the shad, like the whole advice, graph and look for the shad, like I talk about all the time, the shad were out here. So they weren't back in the creeks yet. But I wanted to move back in the creeks because everyone was out in the main lake. And I wanted to see if I could find something. And these little stretches of boat docks, I had four stretches, Randy, uh, in this whole area that had those little shad around them. And in this entire area, I had like one stretch that was like right here that had those around them. There was one stretch back in here, um, right here that had them. And then there was two stretches in this creek right here and then right there. That was all I had. Oh, man, I had five. I had this stretch too. So there was five stretches. And I just refished those same five stretches because that's all I could figure out. But I literally spent practice day driving every single creek in this whole area. And they didn't, none of the docks had those little schools of shad around them except for those five stretches. And that's the ones that had fish. And I spent time fishing other boat docks, trying to, you know, fish them in the tournament and during practice. Wouldn't get bit. So I just kept going to those same, same docks. So that just goes to show that sometimes paying attention to that can be helpful. And then also I remember a day when I was up here, this wasn't like, I didn't catch any like great fish, but what I found, I was fishing in this area of the lake on Table Rock and I would graph and I noticed that I wasn't finding any bait fish in this section of the lake. I don't know why, but I graphed like really deep in the middle of the creeks, everything. I just wasn't finding shad. I don't know why. I don't know where they were. And maybe I was just not thoroughly graphing enough, but they weren't like in obvious, like first half of the Creek in the middle of the guts, like out here. So I'm like, there's no shad on the graph. I don't know what happened to the shad, but there have to be bass here. So my next instinct, because it was pre-spawn, is that there has to be some fish feeding on crawfish. So I found some rock piles out here off these points, started dragging a jig and like a swing head and started hammering them. And you'd see crawfish pincers down those fish's throat. And what I realized is that in this area of the lake, the fish weren't feeding on shad because there just weren't any there. So I could easily just go look for rock piles and every point that had a rock pile on it would have fish so those are just the the observational things randy that i'm talking about where it's like it, and it like you said it takes experience it takes just kind of putting the pieces together so there's no like you know silver bullet anytime you go out to the lake you have to just notice these little things and then adjust and that's that's all it is and that's every time you go fishing and that's why i'm always a big proponent guys i talk about when i go fishing i graph for five to six hours of my fishing day and fish for two hours every time I go when I fish film videos offshore because I don't have practice days for my videos. I just have to go fish. So I literally just graph and graph and graph and graph until I see the elements and get enough info and insight to be able to figure out what's happening. And the same thing up shallow. I might drive my boat for four hours around the lake 
or maybe just get on the trolling motor and like maybe throw a big swim bait around or something to maybe see if I can see a fish come out from under a boat dock or, you know, get a bite on a buzz bait or something. But really all I'm doing is just trying to get a sense for the water clarity. Are there bait fish around? And just getting as much insight and info as possible and then using that to make actionable decisions on. So um, that's, that's all that. But what do you think, Randy? Well, you, you, you hit the nail on the head with awareness because I, you know, that's one of the things that is w- one of the top three most important things in bass fishing that you, most people just do not, they're not interested in it. I can, I can do a YouTube video on my favorite color plastic worm and it gets a tons of views. But if I talk about something really important, like awareness, nobody watches it, but guys, awareness for your surroundings and everything that's happening on the water that's the thing that's going to give you like the giant leaps in your success level. I mean, you're, if you want to just like advance in the sport and get better at a snails level, then focus on the best color plastic worm. But if you want to get good quick, and if you want to get to be one of those, you know, upper level anglers, you have got to expand your awareness on everything that's going around you. Just, it could be anything that's going on the water. It could be on the bank. It could be with the weather. It could be with other fishing pressure. It could be, with how the bass is hooked and the angle that they strike at. I mean, you have got to be an information sponge and that's what leads you to the next fish. And that's what allows you to make those adjustments that pay off because fishing is just a matter of it's, it's, it's like, I know when I go fishing and anyone that's, that's an experienced bass angler, I know that I'm going to catch the bass. I just don't know how long it's going to take me to figure out how to catch them. It could be a, 15 minutes and it could be three days. I I just don't know how long it's going to take. And as as your awareness gets higher and higher and higher and you get clues from the fish, whether they're biting or not, that just gets you closer to catching them. So, you know, pay attention to everything that's going on around you and especially pay attention to that first bite. I mean, the first bite of the day, especially if it's a quality fish, like around three pounds or bigger, that is just such an information gift as far as what you need to do to lead you to that next fish. So, um, you know, try to just work on your awareness above everything else. For sure. For sure. Um, I completely agree with that. And, um, I think at the end of the day, your awareness is something that, again, is something you have to train, and that gets back to the the deep dive app. And I, you know, I keep talking about the deep dive app, guys, because it's something that spent years developing. And the idea with the deep dive app, guys, if you haven't checked it out, is that I went through and I took tournament results from real professional tournaments, and then cataloged them basically and then based on real weather conditions current flow frontal conditions all that stuff along with your water clarity that you can input water temperature the wind and the uh, whether there's vegetation or not we recommend the top patterns based on these tournament results so the idea behind this is that if you put in the right conditions you should get a pattern that gets you going in the right direction this is something that historically has worked in the past um, these are the conditions that are best for these certain uh, you know, baits, but also not just baits, but we also give you the structure and the cover and sonar examples and examples of rock transition banks or whatever it is you need to be fishing. But at the end of the day, the, there are going to be more rock transition banks in the back half of creeks on the channel swing that don't have fish than ones that do have fish. Not every single rock transition bank in the back half of a creek is going to hold fish on any given day. But in the app, we recommend that because that is a pattern that has worked in the past. We know it works. We know it's something that has caught fish before. So that's why we can recommend it. And we know that the bait and cover and structure combinations have been successful and are proven to catch fish. And we then give you some conditions to kind of help with that. But if you go to Table Rock Lake, figuring out which one of those channel swing banks with a rock transition when there's hundreds of them is the key. Maybe it's the ones that have the wind blowing in on them. Maybe it's the ones that are in two foot of water visibility versus three foot of water visibility. In that case, in the app, you would still put stained water. Stained water is the same if you're in two foot or three foot of visibility as far as the app is concerned. We we can't get that granular because it's just too specific. You can't get that specific. It, It overfits the data. But 
maybe those little nuances are there. Maybe there has to be a bunch of bait balls in an area, or maybe there needs to be no bait fish in the area because maybe if there's less bait fish, there's more crawfish, maybe then that's better for that pattern. And there's all these things. And I would love to say, guys, let's put all this information in the app, all these rules of thumb and try to do it. The problem is is those rules of thumb don't work every single time you go to the lake. And Randy, you can attest to this. Fish are not going to do the exact same thing every single time. So just because in one scenario, the bait fish and the shad and all the water conditions worked out perfectly, in another scenario, that might not work. So that's the idea with the Deep Dive app, guys. It gives you a great starting point. It allows you to get some information on what past results have been basically gives you an idea of what the current conditions are gets you some patterns that you know should hold fish but not every single pattern in there is going to work on every single bank i'm fairly confident randy that if the app is recommending a pattern there's a very high likelihood i would say maybe a 75 to 80 percent chance that pattern will work forecasting is kind of tricky because when you forecast something there's always error that's why we don't sometimes have chicken in Walmart because sometimes they think that people are going to buy a hundred piece, hundred packs of chicken. And some that week they buy 120 packs of chicken and you're out of stock. That's why out of stocks happen. You can't perfectly forecast stuff. I was a demand forecaster. So that's why I know this stuff. But with these patterns, we're trying to forecast the best we can. And so I would say 70 to 80% of the time, there's going to be fish biting somewhere on your lake in that pattern. But you have to then put the time in to find those areas, use your awareness, use your situational understanding to make it it happen. So, um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Looks like we got some trolls in the chat. There's been a lot more trolls lately, Randy. I don't know what's going on. I'm trying not to respond to the chat (laughs) because it seems like there's a lot of people who are having issues. Um, I don't know. This is this is so weird. I've never I've never really seen this before. Um, I don't know. Welcome to social there. media. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, That's sort of the reality of the format. Scott was in here uh, and he's he had to leave because of the chat. So thank you guys for running out, Scott I, Martin. I think we got I think we got catfish by a fake Scott Martin there. I don't think Scott would have said that at the end there. Okay. Well. Um, anyways. So I think we have fake Scott Martin in here. Uh, we have two Ryans. I don't know what's happening, guys. Uh, if we don't get this chatter control, I can just not do a chat, and we can just pre-record these live streams. So um, I guess that might be a solution in the future because really at the end of the day, we're here to share fishing knowledge. We're not here to let people dump on each other and all that stuff. I love interacting with the chat guys and seeing your comments and stuff like that, but uh, – it's been getting pretty bad lately. I don't really know why, um, but it uh, it's getting kind of crazy. So, anyways, we're going to uh, we're going to figure this out. But I don't know what's going on. Anyways, um, apparently everything is happening in the chat. I don't know what's going on, um, but uh, whatever. Um, I, all I know is that we hopefully shared some good fishing information with you guys. Huge shout out to Bridgeford. Apologize for the flipped thing. I keep trying to figure out how to flip this camera, Randy, because it shows up flipped on the thing. I've done literally everything I can. Someone had a great recommendation earlier. Uh, actually, who was that? Because I want to. I need to get that. It was all caps. Ricky. Ricky with a great suggestion. If you're still here, Ricky, you are the winner of our Bridgeford Beef Jerky giveaway. I got so caught up in everything I didn't do the giveaway. But if you're still here, Ricky, and you're watching... Uh, you're going to be the winner of our Bridge for Beef Jerky giveaway this week. Just email me at info at fishthemoment.com. That's info, I-N-F-O, at fishthemoment.com. And just send us your mailing address, and we'll get to the Bridgeford, and they'll send you 12 packs of Bridge for Beef Jerky. Huge shout-out uh, to Ricky there. And his comment was, you should contact Bridgeford and ask for backwards-labeled bag. I'm sure it happens sometimes. That is a great idea. We might get a backwards labeled bag because this is very frustrating. I've, I've tried everything, guys, to figure out how to flip this camera because I'm doing a weird setup with the way we stream it. So maybe we'll figure that out. That could that could work out. Um, but uh, yeah, shout out to Ricky, shout out to Bridgeford for supporting the Fishmoat live stream and the Bass Tank. Hopefully you guys are enjoying the info. And uh, Randy, any last comments here to our uh, crazy chat? <laughs> Just appreciate you guys tuning in. This is the first uh, uh, podcast we've done at six o'clock, so uh, we're sort of experiment with that. But thanks for taking some time out of your evening to uh, 
to visit with us a little bit. Appreciate it. Oh, this is uh, one more thing, Randy. Uh, I saw a great suggestion here. If there's people who are in the stream all the time and you would like to be added as an admin to the chat, that might actually help. I don't want to like censor people because that's not like my thing, uh, removing people because uh, we want all the ideas in here. But if we get people who are coming in and they're just being purposely trolly and like y you can tell that they're just causing issues – Maybe we should try to find an admin. I don't know. We'll figure that out. But if anyone is interested and you watch the stream all the time, I'm not promising anything, but just email us, info at fishmoment.com. If I see your name here and recognize you and I feel like, oh, we can trust you, then maybe we can get someone to be an admin and maybe uh, monitor the stream because it's getting a little hey, bit out of hand over here. Hey, there's a catfish. I did not make that comment right there that was just that just said. Oh, God. They got your picture that, and they got Randy over here. Okay. Wow. That, that is um, not me. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know, know where that came from. Well, okay. Um, there's a lot of stuff <laughs> happening here. Um, I, maybe it was that one guy that I tried to get out of the chat the other day. Now he's coming back in full steam. Um, but I don't know what's happening. So, um, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, that's that. <laughs> right here. Okay, that's it, guys. Anyways, um, we'll we'll uh, we'll leave it at that. We'll see you guys next week. The live stream schedule is going all over the place because I'm trying to figure out with my fishing schedule and everything how we handle it. But we're gonna get the live stream schedule figured out. We may just pre-record these, Randy, if this chat gets out of control. I think you guys wouldn't mind that either way, so you can still get the content. But uh, hopefully, you guys enjoyed the stream, and we'll see you guys sometime next week. Have a great night, guys. Okay.